In this video, we're going to talk about economic growth, specifically one model of economic growth called the Harrod Domar model. And to kind of understand why we want to think about economic growth, I thought I'd give a quick example. We normally think of South Korea as a fairly wealthy country, and indeed, if you look up the World Bank report, it says that GDP per capita in South Korea is about 27,000 US dollars, which is quite high. On the other hand, if you look at some other countries, for example, Ghana, GDP per capita is a lot lower. It's just uh, about 1,400 US dollars. And I've been to Ghana, and it's a great place, but you can kind of see that Ghana is a bit poorer and in terms of infrastructure, healthcare, etc., than places like South Korea. What's interesting, though, is if you look way back at 1960, the first point that the World Bank has data on this, actually, Ghana is much wealthier than South Korea. Well, not much wealthier, but is a tad wealthier than South Korea. GDP per capita is 183 US dollars as opposed to 156. Both countries were rather poor at the time, but why in the last 55 years or so did South Korea grow so much more than Ghana? And think about all the quality of life improvements that that means for people that live in South Korea. So economic growth is a pretty interesting thing to think about because it helps us think about human progress in terms of getting wealthier and taking better care of people. So there's this famous quote, I'll just leave it here, by Robert Lucas, a Nobel Prize winning economist, and he says that once you start thinking about growth, it is hard to think about anything else. So when economists started thinking about uh, economic growth, they of course tried to model why some countries got more growth than others. And one model is this Herod Domar model, which ironically wasn't originally created as an economic growth model, but has been used as such. Uh, so we're going to walk through how that model came to be and some of the big assumptions of it. So let's take a look at some of those assumptions. The first assumption is that savings leads to investment. So the idea is when people save money, if banks have money saved, then people can invest it. If companies uh, save money, they could go and spend it on factories and things like that. So savings leads to investment. And how do you represent that? Well, we'll just write that as S equals I. Savings leads to investment. Another big assumption of this model is the idea that investment leads to changes in capital stock. Well, what is capital stock? That's just all the capital that's been accumulated in a country. So say we had this brand new country, it bought 10 solar panels for $1,000 each, then you know it would have capital stock of 10,000. Whoa, uh, ignore my handwriting there. So capital stock would be just uh, 10,000. So we represent capital stock with K. Now, how do we increase capital stock? Well, when people invest in more capital, like buy more solar panels, for example, that leads to a change in capital stock. So if you had 10,000 in one year, and then you bought you know, two more solar panels for 1,000 each, then you'll have 12,000 in the next year. And that's a result of investment, is one of the uh, assumptions of this model. So we could say that investment, which is I, leads to changes in the capital stock. So if there's more investment, there's more change in the capital stock, and the country is accumulating more and more of this capital. OK, um, there is a third assumption, which is perhaps the biggest assumption. And it's this idea that there's a constant capital output ratio. So I'll write it the way it's normally written and rearrange it so it's a little more intuitive. So the idea is that there's this thing called a capital output ratio, which is that for every amount of capital in a country, it leads to so much output per year. So we normally write that as, uh, I'm going to call capital output ratio, I'm going to call this R. So we write that as R equals capital K over Y, which is income. And the idea is that this is a fixed ratio in this model. So this is one of those big assumptions that this model makes. And if there's, maybe in a later video, I'll talk about some criticisms of this model. So capital 
output ratio equals you know capital over output y, which is GDP. And uh, one way to think about this is if you have um, just solar panels, you know you have one thousand dollars of solar panels. Say it makes a hundred dollars a year for each solar panel. So that would mean uh, if we run the numbers, they'll say you have capital of one thousand and you have income of one hundred. So you have R equals to 10 in that case. So that's the capital output ratio. Now, a big assumption of this model is this capital output ratio is fixed. And it might make some sense in some examples. So say there's only solar panels, and each solar panel creates $100 per year in electricity, say. So if you buy five more solar panels, they're still going to make $100 each. So that would be constant capital output ratio. So let's just go with it for now. Let's assume that this is true. So if that's the case, then r equals k over y. And importantly, if r is fixed, that means a change in k must lead to the same change in y. Because if k goes up, y must go up, because that ratio is fixed. So if uh, k went up to 200, then y must go up, uh, 2000, y must go up to 200 to make that r still equal to 10 in this example. Okay, so those are three of the big assumptions in this model. And what can we do with that? Well, it turns out we could create an equation that seems to model economic growth. So if we uh, take a look at that, here's what we could do. So what is really change in y? What is change in GDP? Well, change in GDP really is just economic growth. So let's try to solve for that. So let's multiply both these uh, sides of the equation by change in y. So we have change in y times our capital output ratio equals a change in the capital stock. But remember, we've also written that change in the capital stock is equal to investment. So we could say that change in y equals times uh, r equals um, investment. And if we keep going with this, we could see change in y equals investment over r by defining both sides by r. And finally, we could say change in y equals savings over r because up here, we had said that savings is equal to investment. So it's quite an interesting result because what this model argues is that the only way to increase GDP in a country, which is change in y, is by increasing or influencing the savings rate. Because remember, r, the capital output ratio, is fixed in this model. So if we take our example of a country, say it's just has savings of, you know, half a US dollar. And we use the same r, the same capital output ratio of 10. Then we get a change in y as 0.5 over 10, or 0.05, or 5%. So that is a modest uh, growth rate, but not a fantastic growth rate. So what this model would argue is, well, how about we just double that? You know, if we could get our savings rate to suddenly change instead of 0.5 to uh, 1, we save 1 unit, then we'll have 1 over 10, and then we'll have 10% growth per year, which is quite fantastic growth. So this is a how this model um, came to this conclusion, and once again, it is from these three big assumptions. That savings leads to investment, investment leads to changes in capital stock, and there's a constant capital to output ratio. And as I've alluded to in this video, there are really flaws in all of these assumptions. All models have to make assumptions, but there are flaws in all of these assumptions, and that is what kind of makes the model not that valid. So there are other growth models that have come out since then that are more appropriate and that economists think are better ways to model the world. So maybe in a later video, we'll talk about some of the criticisms of this model and why the predictions don't always pan out.